Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you ESCC for uh, having us here. Uh, let's talk about AI. So um, let me introduce uh, my company first. Uh, we are present in North America, US, Canada, and also in Finland. I have a colleague of mine here, Dr. Petri Salon, and we are both, both based here in Dallas. What we do is we help companies build great products in terms of strategy, design, and development. Now, in this presentation, uh, we're going to cover three aspects. So first one is the personal implications for all of us that the generative AI brings. We're going to dive into the other flavors of AI in the later presentations. Then we're going to look into companies, which companies are set to benefit of the AI. And finally, uh, how can we drive this change rather than be passengers uh, in it? And uh, I have some bad news uh, for you to start with. AI is out there to get our jobs. And AI is doing it very well. In fact, half of our jobs will be gone in 22 years. How come? I'll tell you in a minute. But this is a tr transformation that has been ongoing for a longer time. So if we go back to the Industrial Revolution and the invention of steam engine, that's where people like us started displacing people from the countryside to the cities and through the means of technology, revolutionizing uh, the, the concept of work through automation. Then later with electricity and with the uh, uh, Henry Ford's like, uh, production lines, uh, the work changed again. And it was the work of craftsmen. Earlier, you need skilled individuals to build a belt or a car or whatever. But after that moment on, things could be mass produced. But again, there were new jobs created as a result of that. And more recently, through automation and robotics, more and more jobs have been automated. But there's always been the next level of jobs. So with this development, there was software engineering. We needed millions and millions of developers. So there was always something that you could go ahead with, with good education, you could find a, a new job. Now, AI is out there to get us, right? So what we mean with that is that uh, uh, if you remember a year ago, ChatGPT came to general awareness. So the large language models, um, the, the um, uh, ability to generate text and videos and, and photos with the press of a button. And that is going to have a fundamental change to the work that we do. So if you think about our work, what we do, we lead people, we manage people, we do a lot of talking, writing, generating uh, opinions, facts, and then distributing those. And a generative AI is going to make that so much more effective. And that's something we have all personally experienced, but now there is also data to that point. And, and uh, this data is from the Harvard, and they studied the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, they gave a team of consultants the AI tools and then a uh, like comparison group did the same kind of tasks without the AI tools. And whatever measure they took, whether it was quality, the number of assignments completed, the time of completion, AI tools demonstrably uh, made, it, made the work more effective. So the kind of work that we do is applying expertise. And a year ago, if you asked me, like, what is the automation potential of our kind of work, it was 30%. So all the existing technologies could take away 30% of our work. And now that number has doubled. It's 60%. So 60% of the work I do can be automated. Well, can be is a bit of a fluffy thing. Of course, it can be, but like, what does it mean in reality? Uh, the midpoint estimate is that by 2045, in 22 years, half of our current work in the, in the business and, and legal uh, tasks will be automated. And that's why I say half the jobs will be gone. And 20 years sounds like it's a long time. If somebody says 20 years ago, for me, it sounds like 1980s, but then I have to remind me that it was actually 2003. So 22 years from now is not that far away. Good. Then let's look more from the opportunity perspective. So who stands to benefit of this? What kind of companies, what kind of functions, what kind of tasks will benefit of the generative AI? And uh, if you ask the people who are already involved in AI, one third of them mentions cost cutting as their primary objective. It's not the only objective, but the primary objective. Two thirds of the people mention something else, like building better offering, making more money or profit with the existing uh, products, or venturing into some new business areas. 
So the good news is that if you want to benefit of the AI, it doesn't matter what kind of situation you are in. Even if your company is looking at cost savings, there are ways that uh, generative AI can help. But, but how? Where should you go? This data is from McKinsey, and uh, it, there are a few functions that stand out. So bringing the benefits, 75% uh, of the total uh, impact of generative AI can be attributed to six different functions. So the ones I highlighted here with red are sales, marketing, and customer operations. And that's kind of logical, because these kind of functions are something where we use a lot of words. We generate videos, we generate images, and, and, and so on. Another thing in, in this kind of group of functions is that every company has some kind of sales and marketing function. The other group is then uh, software engineering. And, and that was kind of a surprise. So ChatGPT and the large language models were built to generate human language. And they understand that on a very deep level. So they're not translation engines, but they understand the uh, language on a deeper level. And they are fluent in Finnish and Spanish and English and all the languages, but surprisingly also in Java and C Sharp and C plus and all the, all the uh, programming languages. And that makes these functions, uh, software development, a prime disruption point for generative AI. Another driver, of course, is that um, pretty much every company is a software company nowadays. It doesn't matter what vertical you play in, software plays a crucial role there. Another thing you might want to pay attention is the impact and how big it is. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars here on annual impact. So anything on the lower end of this chart may look small in comparison, but they are still huge opportunities. If you want to benefit of the AI, it may be that you want to go to a more a less crowded space where there's less competition uh, to, to operate in. So if you're interested in being a driver in this generative AI train rather than a passenger, how can you resave things? How can you make an impact? Well, this data is from, from Gartner, and it's, it's a classic buy versus build uh, um, like continuum. On the left-hand side here, we have the pure buy play. Um, so um, generative AI is in an ecosystem building phase. It's land grabbing phase. I worked uh, with Nokia and uh, um, Microsoft during the mobile industry when we were building the ecosystems. And it is a, it's a, like a limited time window business. You want to make an impact, you want to establish your position in the market, and then if you're late entrant, it's very hard. So what it means for us is that both the tech giants and the VC community are pouring tens or hundreds of billions of money into this space, and they are building great offering that is available for us to consume for a reasonable price. So there's nothing wrong with starting your AI journey by taking commercially available products and putting those into good use. But again, it's not just licensing some software. That's the easy bit. It requires a signature and some money. The impact on people is much bigger. How do we keep up the workforce, our teams engaged in this new world? So if we look at the uh, players in the, in the current kind of uh, uh, AI scene, so, so companies that have at least one AI project ongoing, 15% of them expect that they will be net hiring in the future. They need to hire more people. Three times that number, 43%, believe that they will be reducing their workforce. So when I say that half of us will be losing our jobs, it's not going to be rosy for everybody. Now, the last number, it may be a bit challenging, like uh, first thing in the morning, but uh, let's try to uh, unravel that. So 56% of the companies expect that at least one in 10 people in their teams needs to be retrained in the next three years. And that's just three years, and we're at the beginning of this change curve. So it's only going to accelerate from now on. And 10% of the workforce may not sound like a lot, but it is a lot. It's not just the guys who want to go for the MBA and who are studying on their free time and who are like open for new things. We're going to see a lot of jobs changing so that the people who are resistant for a change need to learn how to new, uh, use new tools. Uh, their processes will be totally uh, changed. Moving on from the pure by play, to building products, which is my personal passion. So you can, you can do something more complex. You maybe don't want to take like off-the-shelf offering. Um, and if we look at this embed space, you see that the blue part is like uh, provider managed. Somebody else covers the hard parts of the tech stack for you. You don't need to build a new foundation model. You don't need to go through the fine tuning it and so on. You just need to build the application on top of that. Sounds easy, right? This is exactly the wrong way of doing it. 
Remember, you need to start from the user experience and work your way back into technology. Who said that? Steve Jobs, come on, you know that. Right? <laughs> but it's still valid. It is still valid. You shouldn't be building actually AI products. You should be building great products that are AI enhanced. Who said that? I did. <laughs> Okay, so you can, uh, like starting from a great uh, user experience, understanding the needs, bringing the pains or ad uh, bring the gains or addressing the pains, you can bring now better products in the market with the help of the AI. And then if it's necessary, you can go further down in the tech stack. So you can start looking at the prompt engineering, you can bring in your own data, you can go into fine tuning the models, but every step you take deeper into the te tech stack, the thick stack makes it more uh, challenging. So make as little changes as necessary and focus on the user experience. That's, that's my message there. Now, this is going to bring one more challenge that I want to highlight. And it's again about people. If every company is a, is a tech company and every company needs to do something in the AI, where are we going to find all these people? You need to have AI experts. Data is very important, so uh, managing the data. Somebody needs to be building those applications. Not every company needs those resources constantly. It may be a project. Not every uh, company can uh, attract the talent. They cannot recruit them. And if they manage to recruit, they may not be able to retain the talent. So if we, again, look into companies who are already in the AI path, who have used AI, and we ask them, like, are you planning to increase the use of partners? 67% say yes, two thirds of the companies. And less than 10% say, no, they're going to do less. So one of the crucial factors for succeeding in the AI game is finding the right technology partners, somebody who can help companies in, in doing this. And as it happens, we are here to help you. ACX, <laughs> we have run uh, webinars, a number of them. Pedri, my colleague, is going to run one next week. So go to our website and find content. If you don't find something that's interesting for us, uh, reach out to us. We'd love to hear your opinions. Also during the break, come and talk to us. Thank you very much.